Namaste and in La Quetz, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and this week we have a very special guest in the form of James Kerr. James is one of those phenomenal kind of leadership coaches and writers and doers, movers and shakers in the leadership world that you will rarely find. He is a number one ranked leadership coach as think or by Thinkers 360. He is a management consultant and leadership coach, coach for indispensable consulting for approaching 40 years. Um, he, I believe, is uh, also an adjunct professor that uh, at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is a pretty cool place to be. Uh, he's a columnist for Psychology Today, as well as Inc. Magazine. So, James, thank you very much for showing up today and uh, engaging in the conversation. Yeah, Sam, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. I think this is going to be fun and insightful, I hope. And, uh, uh, me too, right? Thanks for having, now, me, having me on. Did you have some uh, books? I, I did a little bit of, of research in, in the time constraint that I had. I believe that you also are the author of a book called Legacy. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not ah, me. All right. Well, I gave you credit anyway. Maybe it's one you should write. <laughs> well, yes, uh, there is a guy out there doing the same kind of stuff that I do. And he wrote a book called Legacy, which is on a, it's really a leadership book, but it talks about the rugby team out in I guess New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, beautiful place. Years ago, yeah. Well, you are a legacy in, in your field, so that would be an appropriate, at least, uh, moniker for you to carry for the moment, right? Uh, yeah. so, I mean, my latest book's kind of behind me. It's indispensable. Indispensable. Yeah, so that's that's book number six, and I'm in the middle of writing book number seven as we speak. So. so what's it like, uh, before we get into the normal course and conversation, what's it like, the writing process for you? Well, you know, I, I really, I know a lot of folks look at it as a chore, but I really look forward to writing. It, it gives me an opportunity to uh, really think through the topics that I'm covering. Um, it helps me to demystify some of the stuff that I think uh, other thought leaders might exaggerate or, or make bigger than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and it makes me kind of land in on what I believe to be true and in, in ways to get uh, particularly businesses and organizations to operate in a different kind of way in, in a way that's uh, going to help them achieve their goals and, and um, be a good place for people to work and, and, and do their, uh, their things too. So it's a lot of what my writing's about. And like I said, I look forward to it. I do it every day. I'm either writing an article or a section of a book. Something, or, right. Oh, yeah. it, it's, yeah. uh, it's such an enjoyable process for me too. And, and do you find it to be the, not just being able to distill the practical and pragmatic for your readers, but also the cathartic moments that one has in going through the process, right? The learning things of, of ourselves and others that we consider. Sure. You know, I, I get a lot of satisfaction from, from those sort of breakthrough moments where you're, ah, okay, this is a way for me to talk about this. This this is something that I know will work, uh, et cetera. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I get a lot out of it. It helps me uh, fine tune what my consulting and coaching is about. And um, I feel like it's all about contributing sort of to the betterment of leadership thinking. And you do quite well in that. Thank you. Now, speaking of tuning in, my guests often have some place in their life, whether it's in their youth, in their teens, later in life, mid-40s, uh, they have some kind of connection or recognition of a connection to their inner self and, and what's going on with it that's you know, uh, not necessarily a separate reality, and yet sometimes it can be because we experience it alone. What kinds of, of things and, and being who you are and what you're doing now, that to me had to have some early development in your connection with your inner self and the world. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I feel like from a very early age, I, I learned to sort of be 
self-aware you know like mm -hmm. how am i coming across what am i doing right now am i in the moment am i you know being all i can be not to sound corny but you know it, it became uh something that i learned I, I think from my parents probably my father in particular who was uh one of these people that was you know always kind of looking to self-improve and, and all that he was not a formally educated man but he was a widely educated man and mm -hmm. and i think uh that rubbed off on me and and you know we'd have these i can remember deep conversations he'd sit in his um you know, in his bedroom, and I'd, I'd sit with him, and he'd be smoking a cigarette, and the place would be blue with smoke, and, and then we'd start talking about, you know, philosophical, mo you know, notions and things, and what do you think about that, and he, he would really kind of, um, you know, want to engage at, at that level with me. At, That's a, such a blessing. Yeah, I really longed really. for that from, from yeah. my father, and um, you know, being an adoptee that one, you know, really wants to have that connection. I, I felt like I had it early on as I got older though. Uh, and also him being a 32nd degree Mason, mm -hmm. there was this understanding. It's like, okay, you're deep into this. I was also, uh, I went through DMLA. And so there was this deeply instilled value system, right? And it seemed to lead to more of the spiritual, the philosophical conversations. And yet there was a hesitancy to go there. And, and as a teen, I kind of um, broke the, the mold, I suppose, in, in how I approached that uh, as an awakening and the things that happened to me in the moment. And I think it kind of gave him a little more um, hesitancy to talk to me because of the nature of what I was trying to talk about and it being so on the fringe of what was available at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course that didn't come up until he was 80 in his eighties. He said, you know, I, I understand you, but I was just afraid you'd say the wrong thing, the wrong place and get put away. Huh. And so <laughs> right, I never did. However, um, you know, those kinds of things, did you in those philosophical and, and, uh, investigative conversations you had with your father what were the kinds of things that made the most significance or, or had the most significance for you in your early development that then led to greater observations and self-awareness well you know one of the things that my father really instilled uh in me and, and my younger sister was that idea that you've got to kind of be willing to do what other people aren't willing to do if you if you mm. want to be successful, you've got to go above and beyond. You can get there through hard work. Um, you know, here's a guy that worked 35 years in a felt mill. You know, that was his his uh, sort of lot in life. But he wanted more for his kids, and and I, he certainly encouraged us to um, don't wait for someone to do it for you. You've got to do it yourself. So self-initiating was the major theme then of that, and very true, right? It's that willingness to step up and step out of the crowd to do something regardless of what it is and not right. paying attention to what others are saying and just following your gut as to where to go and what right. to do. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's that general sort of notion that, I think was a theme. There were probably several others, but you know, related to that theme comes the courage to be yourself, the courage to do to do that thing that other people might um, criticize you for, ridicule you of. I, mean, I can remember writing my first book and, and having people tell me that, "Oh, you'll never get it published. You'll never, you know, find a, a interested uh, company to publish this," you know, and so on. And and I. I published my first book way back when, I mean, you know, before the internet was a thing. And right. I can remember um, literally writing the thing longhand and handing it to an assistant who I'd hired to to type it up for me, who typed it up on, you know, using paper. And we mailed the paper manuscript to a publisher. And the very first one I sent it to was uh, Wiley and Sons, you know, major. Great publisher. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, respect it right away. You know, there was, it was the very first 
thing. You know, I didn't even really write a proposal. I simply sent them the manuscript. I think this would be a great book. What do you think? And within about a week, I got a uh, phone call and they said, hey, we want to do this with you. Let's do it. So That's amazing. And completely the opposite experience of what your you know, cohorts were well, telling. Well, right. I, you know, it's, I guess early on, a lot of motivation was driven from sort of that chip on your shoulder, you know, sort of the Tom Brady story of those <laughs> folks familiar with with the sports figure you know he he becomes this incredible nfl player sure to be a hall of famer and and what was his motivation it was the fact that he was you know selected sort of next to last i think in the nfl draft and nobody expected mm -hmm. to to really do anything but through hard work. and like kurt warner for arizona yeah, right came sure, was a sack boy and then decided um, exactly. i was fortunate to to know kurt and had some wonderful conversations with him. I worked for the Cardinals for a bit. And um, just a very, one of the most humble men yeah. you can imagine. Sure. He was just down home, you know, conversant, had time for everybody. It, it was just soft, right? Yeah. Except on the field. Yeah. <laughs> well, it strikes, it's, he strikes me as such. I don't know him, of course. But he's, you know, he's sort of a personality out there now in, in mm -hmm. uh, the NFL uh um, coverage of the NFL and and yeah he seems like a really approachable authentic guy he is and and a lot of them are I would believe now you mentioned something you know that I want to dig further if you don't mind in that moment of I got accepted against the odds that everybody was telling me about this happened for real did you consider how what you thought felt and the actions you took to make that happen and then how to repeat that and build something around that that was consistent as a habitual pattern right we always look for those habits and patterns in our lives that are most productive and we want to dispel those that aren't so was there a period that, that you went through of acknowledging that of really self-examining what you went through, how you thought, how you felt, and the results you got from that. Obviously, when you were doing it, it was just a matter of course of doing, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I sat back and deliberately considered, you know, what's the formula for this kind of thing? How do I make it repeatable or anything like that? Mm -hmm. It became a real blur. When that book hit the streets, I mean, it, it just took off, and I had all kinds of speaking engagements and, and I made quite a bit of money on the side just just going to conferences and and, and speaking and again I, I was I was under the age of 30 I mean in today's uh, I should say through today's lens that's maybe not that significant there seems to be a lot of folks that have you know done a, a lot professionally at, at, a, at younger ages and stuff but this is in a time when there was no social media there was no you know, um, no major promotions. It yeah, was a lot yeah, of hard yeah, work and blood, sweat, and tears to get it done. Yeah, you know, but publishing a book was a big deal. There, there was no self-publishing option. Right. You know, sure, there was Vanity Press or something where you might print up, you know, two dozen copies of something for your family or whatever. But, but things like the Amazon, Amazon wasn't even a business yet when this book came out. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it was, uh, I, I sort of developed a following. I had people that really uh, were interested in, uh, in learning more about what I was writing about. It, it was a book on, on technology strategy. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, it was about data and how to manage data in a, in a, uh, in a way that could, my theory was we should be able to manage it in such a way that it becomes an asset we track on a balance sheet. Sure. And, and this was like way before people even had, there were no words to, to talk about. I know, it, isn't it funny? And even in the change that we're having now with this massive market shift, there's really no words to explain what's happening internally with folks that are in this throes of change and wondering what the heck to do about it, right? right. Yeah. So I'm hoping we can give them at least some... Sure reasonable foundation from which to grow their own 
self-awareness from. Um, now in speaking of self-awareness, in that process, did you find that there was, and speaking of data and integration and management, you know, our minds are just a big data storage and right. how we manage that, the kinds of thoughts we think, the 70,000 a day we have that probably two thirds are self-deprecating for most people, yeah. right? How did you find your crossover? Because what you're, you know, we live half inside and half outside. So what you were doing internally was expressed externally in the write-up of the data and systems management. How do you see that bridge working to for personal development as well yeah well I, I again i think it does start with self-awareness and then as you're alluding to that whole idea of self-talk right we, there's chatter going on between our ears all day long and it really does have an impact on how we behave outwardly so a lot of the coaching work that i do is focused on helping uh those leaders i do leadership coaching uh, exclusively but it, it, if I'm trying to help somebody become a better leader they've got to first come become in touch with who they are inside and what messages they're sending to themselves all mm -hmm. day long if they make a mistake and immediately call themselves a name you know that's an important thing to recognize because if we can change that that thinking if we can flip the script if you will that goes on inside we can start to adopt a different kind of mindset, uh, one that's more focused on growth sure. and learning and, and, and all of that. So, so yeah, I, I think it's really important. It's been something that I've, I've been practicing for a very long time. And I, again, I kind of uh, credit my father, you know, and, and, and some of those early conversations that I had kind of shaping that up. You know? well, and it gave you the opportunity to think about it, right? right. It, it's like it's we can't really know stuff that we don't know right we need to have someone at least offer some awareness that right. you know gives us a chance to ponder um you know the, a big part of a big part of what he's what he was talking about now as i look back at it you know um 50 years later kind of thing you know it, it's it's a uh, it was about accountability yeah. It, it was about being, you know, like you you are accountable for yourself and how you behave and what you're thinking and how you're, be, you know, uh, bringing yourself into the world kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you know, are you proud? Are you proud of, of what you're doing and, and, and how you're behaving and all that? And, and you know, to me, it was a huge part of growing up is, is just that acceptance of the accountability. Like, and to your point, Zen, you only can be accountable for what you know. But once you know something, you really need to be accountable for it. Now you don't have an excuse for it. Yeah, that. there's no excuses. Yeah, you know <laughs> it, you better apply it. Or, you know, you got a good look in the mirror to say, hey, buddy, buck up, right? Right, right. you know better. Right. Now, you know, with self, we use this term, self-awareness, right? How deep does that really go or can it go in ascertaining the fullness of our own being and willingness to operate in a sense of empoweredness in the world what what's that take how what have you found are the key elements of that well i mean one of the things that i do with with the folks that i coach is i ask them to and you, you may smile at this but you know set the timer on the phone You've got a cell phone that, that's probably constantly buzzing all day long, right, if you let it. So set timers, just make them at odd times throughout the day. And when that thing goes off, immediately stop and go, what was I thinking right now? Was I in the moment? Was I worried about the future? Was I dwelling on something that happened in the past? How was I talking to myself? Was I being positive? Was I being negative? Did I see this mistake as a learning opportunity or did I see it as like, you know, the world coming to an end? Mm -hmm. And the more we did that, you know, the more we have people do it four or five, six, seven, eight times a day over the course of a week, we come back together. So I have weekly sessions with the folks I'm coaching. So how was it? What did, what did you discover? And it's amazing what they discover. Oh yeah, so many people are talking negatively all day. They talk to themselves in ways they would never talk to another person. 
Why and do you think we do I that? I wonder why they don't perform well. Yeah. Well, you're beating yourself up all day long. Is that something that comes from program, childhood, friends, neighbors, church, community, you know, kind of all of those things? And how do we recognize it that as we get older in order to, I mean, your process is a perfect one. Are there other ways that that awareness of, of being in the moment or not, right? And, and the effects of that past, I mean, like Lao Tzu, right? If you're in the past or the future, you're in stress, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not being stressed is to absolutely. be present. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, let, yeah. let's, let's amplify that point, Zen, because it, again, it's okay. something I, that, I, that I do do in coaching. You know, if I find that someone's worrying about stuff that's about to happen or might happen, we start to talk about like, well, what is that? What if? Of, yeah, yeah. Well, what's the benefit of that kind of thinking to you? You know, and what inevitably happens, and I try to help point this out, is that thinking about the future is actually creating anxiety. They become anxious, mm -hmm. right? And similarly, someone that's dwelling about what happened in the past and ruminating on that, well, that leads to depression. So I can't really control anything that's happened already. And I certainly can't, I can have an impact on the future, but I can't control it because there's too many variables, too many other people doing their own things to really control it, right? So the only thing I can control is me. And I can choose to think more positively and act appropriately and, and do all that, or I can choose not to, it's up to me. But the only thing I can control in the equation is me and my behavior and my thoughts. So the only thing I can really experience is the moment because we don't know what's going to happen next. We really don't. Right. No. So, and, so, that, so that's kind of helping people see that and recognize that. And, you know, is really it seems like such a simple point of recognition, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah, it is simple. But hard and to... yet we are so <laughs> full of fear and anxiety and depression and, and all those kinds of things. And, we seem to kind of get lost in those things until somebody knocks on our door and says, hello, <laughs> where are you? Right. And come back. Uh, so, you know, and, and the self-deprecating thing was you were talking about that. Um, some of us, my self in particular uh, is one that in college, a lot of your psychic senses are blown open in the discovery of self and exploration of mind and, and all that spirit, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened to me in walking back from the cafeteria to the honors dorm one day, as I passed other students, there was all this negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. It all started with you and then went into some kind of self-deprecating stuff. And of course, when you're hearing you, you think you, right? It's all about me. And I wasn't recognizing that I was actually hearing others because I was so sensitive at the time. And it wasn't until a couple of days later, I actually went back and locked myself in my dorm room for a while because it really freaked me out. Mm -hmm. And I, I got really paranoid. And then mm -hmm. a friend of mine came by and says, where are you? Where have you been? <laughs> and I told him what happened. And he asked a simple question. Was that your voice or was it others? Yeah. And when that simple question, I realized it was others. It's like, oh, okay. And then he said, well, you're obviously sensitive and you're hearing others' thoughts. So mm -hmm. recognize that's them, not you. Mm. And so I think maybe sometimes we unaware because we are so sensitive and, and we are all energy. We're aware of thoughts. We're susceptible to them. And depending on our level of openness and vulnerability, we can really, you know, pick up some really wild stuff. And, and yeah. in those kinds of cases, did you have those moments in, in your youth where some of those doors opened up and you had to kind of deal with what was on the other side? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess so. I, I, I had, 
again, I don't want to dwell on the importance of this um, because it, 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 my experience is right. Like we, like all of us, it's uniquely mine, right? But but my father, being so close with him, I could literally talk to him about anything. Uh -huh. So having that door open is is huge for for a, a young kid, for a teenager, right? To be able to go in there and talk really honestly about about everything. And uh, there was, uh, I don't think there was a subject that was off limits or that I felt uncomfortable talking about. So when I felt any kind of doubt or, um, you know, had a lack of confidence about something or, or you know, needed advice or whatever I, I had a place to go and not everybody does you know and mm -hmm. i'm just really blessed to to have that absolutely and that's in today's that's even then that's a rare occurrence yeah it really was yeah and i and i know it wasn't the relationship that it, my father had with my grandfather you know so so it, it but he uh, chose to make it different for you yeah, because of that Absolutely. And that gave you a foundation. It seems that would you think that that's really what gave you the foundation to explore life and, and dynamics and especially the level that you went to at, in dealing with organizational development? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, because it, it, it gave me sort of that belief or developed the belief that you, you really could achieve. And I said this already, but you can achieve whatever you want to, whatever you set your mind to do, if you're mm -hmm. willing to put in the work, if you're willing to sacrifice, because you will, you know, in pursuing uh, your dream, you'll get in touch with people who can guide and help you along the way. Isn't that interesting how, you know, it's like Gote says, right? You know, um, whatever you can dream, begin it. Boldness has magic, uh, um, power, magic, and, and Okay, so now I forgot the, the quote. Anyway. Um, well, it's that whole Oprah thing, right? It, it, you know. It, <laughs> she, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and know, yet, it, this it, is it, thousands of years though. old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So how can we, do you think, um, redevelop, restore, reimagine this, you know, pulling the ancient wisdom which generally has been considered to be spiritual instead of, you know, the, the very pragmatic and, and practical kinds of things, the science, right? Even though science was once called philosophy. So <laughs> that changed in 1400. Today, though, how do we or how do you think we can restore what is that inner wisdom that is available and a counterpart to the outer success well i'll tell you what you're not going to find it online you know <laughs> it's not going to be social media that's going to unlock your you know uh potential or 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 this you know insight it might provide hints but it's definitely not going to give yeah, you yeah you know, I, mean, I i just feel like people are looking in the wrong place for that stuff i, I think you got to start with with you as an individual that's why that self-awareness piece is so critical we've got to know where we're starting from mm -hmm. and and then work on what we need to get where we want to go so yes dream big be willing to pay the price to make that dream come true and all of, all of that but know where you are know who you are where you're starting get comfortable with it what are the kinds of questions that you found <laughs> right don't absolutely don't fight it because the breadcrumbs is about flow and the only way you get not flow is by resisting or fighting or having those self-deprecating thoughts and things of that nature how do you find that in the the process of moving into that place of flow what are the kinds of end knowing self what are the kinds of questions that take you to that place of inner knowing, being, connectedness, and eventually flow as to how, what your dreams and visions can manifest in the outer world? Yeah, I mean, you've got you've to unplug. You've got to just be, 
you know, some folks will practice meditation and, and some of these other uh, things. I've, I've done that in the past. I'm not actively doing it. I, I think I might get back to it. I don't know. But <laughs> but at the moment, I, I'm not really actively doing this. But partly because I do it all the time. You know, like when, right. when I get up in the morning, I'm thinking about what's what am I trying to accomplish? Where am I? Who am You know, all that stuff kind of it's just part of a checklist that I do. Well, it's it. focused, it, it seems, focused attention, intention, and interaction on more specifics. You you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily tunnel vision. However, there's this, um, I think John English calls it a momentum tunnel, right? Where you... I uh, like that. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's kind of cool. And, and um, one of the ways I think about it too, maybe this will apply, you know what a tesseract is. Hmm. Okay. So thinking of the intention that we have and throwing it out in front of us, not that we are obsessed about the future. However, we can still plan and strategize for it. Right. And so with the tesseract idea, your intention goes out and then essentially what you're seeking is seeking you because then you're able to embrace it as the, as it returns to you in the way that it has worked out, maybe not necessarily exactly like you've planned it. However, it still shows up now acknowledging that. And I see your head nodding. He's like, yep, that's how it happens. That's how it happens. So great example. How do you find, what are the kinds of things that you find essential to create that flow? of how the future is coming to you and, and how you prepare in order to receive it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, again, at first it starts with what, be, you know, be specific, really try to describe what it is you're trying to accomplish, make it vivid and compelling, make it, make it so wonderful that you can't imagine not pursuing it, right? right? And as you start to do it, and that's the big problem that I have with a lot of the sort of the pop psychology stuff, they'll get you to sort of the, the doorway, but mm -hmm. they fail to sometimes tell you to go through it. Right, right. Well, it's like the law of attraction, right? All of the hubbub about it was, oh, yeah, you can do this, you can do that. However, right. there's it left out the interaction. Absolutely. Yes. And like, that makes no sense whatsoever if you, if right. you don't include that piece because nothing else can happen if you don't. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So so that's the biggest the biggest thing is it really be clear, make it compelling, and then be prepared to do whatever it takes to 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 get there. And that's that's the difference between people that have incredible success and get a lot accomplished and those that just talk about it. Mm-hmm. Now, in the accomplishment and, and how you were the, the, the moving on into the oh, mid part of the 2030s, 20s, 30s, even 40s, what were the kinds of things that you found were more consistent in your own development that might assist others in that maturation period as well? Well, you know what? I, I think it is critical for us to develop coaching and or mentoring kinds of relationships we need others we can't do this by ourselves and back you know the the teenage gym needed dad to kind of ask the right questions and 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 get me thinking about the right stuff and then he always reminded me that it was up to me though like at the end of it i still had to own it like i, right. I couldn't wait for him to do it i had to do it for me right yeah and yeah, where there's where there were moments where he said where he'd ask a question and you'd say, "Hmm, that's a great question," because <laughs> it hadn't occurred to you before, right? I, I get that I, in my absolutely. coaching sessions as well. Yeah. yeah, and 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 I think again, I believe that there are all kinds of guides and spirits along the way. Mm -hmm. We just have to be open to them. Uh, and, and thank you for recognizing that, and at your level to have that kind of recognition and, and awareness that, yeah, there are other things beyond this world that we interact with. We may not understand it. However, it does happen. I had a wonderful conversation with a 92-year-old past bank president here in Phoenix that said he was just, still had his office, said, I'm just here to talk to people. So I had an idea for an international cultural center. I was, was in my bachelor's degree. It was in the late 80s. 
And I thought, okay, I'm going to go talk to him just because he was available. And I presented my ID. He said that the wonderful, you just need to go out and find the pieces. And then for the next hour, we talked about the psychic gifts that his wife had and how they helped him in developing the bank's business. And he and his brother brought 70% of business into Arizona in the 30s and 40s. Yeah. So all of these things, it's like, wow, here's, you know, one of these guys that's hugely successful and says, yes, these two tools are available and I advise using them. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. how did that I mean, affect again, you? Mentor, mentors and coaches. I mean, I, I, I think those played a huge role uh, in my further developments as, as I got older. You know? Were there any things in particular that happened that were just off the charts weird that turned out <laughs> that, that then gave you a deeper understanding of how integrated reality is? You, you know, <laughs> those kind of moments happen to me an awful lot. I kind of figured it might. Um, and I I don't have anyone that really like, oh, wow, look at this, you know, really, really blew Well, me. a couple would be good, too. I mean, you know, two or three, even. Just something, yeah. that, you know, but, something. And I know I'm, I'm peaking old memories, and, and you hadn't thought about that stuff for a while. And, um yeah, I mean, it just it just seems that when I needed something, it suddenly appeared, you know, and it would come in, in a conversation I might be having where someone said something that I needed to hear, maybe had nothing to do with the, uh, the core of the conversation we were having, mm -hmm. but the point, like, resonated and actually helped me deal with something else that I wasn't even talking to the person about, you know, those kinds so of things. So your attenuation to those pieces was high. Yeah, and they, and they continue to be. I mean, it's amazing. Like, I, I may see something, and you know, on television or or whatever, and it's it's a couple of words that that I find interesting, you know, because as a person that writes, words have a lot, mean a lot to me. I'm hip, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, wow, that's a clever way to say that. And then, like, the next day, I'm in a conversation, and somebody actually says those things again in the context in which I was, you know, trying to look to apply it, you know. And I'm like, wow, now, now some would argue, well, that's nothing. That's just because you're paying attention to stuff and you're thinking about X. So, uh, as a consequence, everything looks like X. And I guess you can make that an argument, but I, I choose to believe it's more. There's more it's to still it. there, though. Yeah, it's, it's, there's something. It's not that, like it's not there and you're making shit up. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it's, you're paying attention to what is around you. And right. it seems, and maybe you can reflect on this a bit, that in that place, there's the ultimate connection of what you're seeking is seeking you. And it, and it shows up in all kinds of different ways. Absolutely. Yep. And to refute it is probably not a good idea. <laughs> well like i said earlier in, in sort of a slightly different context you can't resist it you know like you, you have to accept who you are and know what you're trying to do know what you're about in order to receive these these things and be open to the to the people that are willing to help you, you yeah know, absolutely mentors and coaches and as i mentioned earlier i mean they're there you just have to um you know, open yourself up, be vulnerable to accepting what they have to offer. Not everything they're going to offer you is is going to be helpful either. I mean, no, there's there's discernment in that. However, when you have your antennae articulate or um, accentuated or attenuated, actually is the word, to the right frequency that you're needing, you're going to pick it up. Yeah. That, that's just it's energy, and you attune to the frequency that you vibrate at. Right. This is law of attraction and, and we're all energy vibrations. So it would make sense that those things would be a present. Now, speaking of making sense, do you find that there is a bridge between the, the science and spiritual language that's emerging in business fields today? 
You know, I wonder. I don't know. I, I, I and here's why I wonder. I, I feel okay. like folks are looking for angles, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm a little too skeptical. I don't know, but but it's really interesting to me that somebody who has really glitzy advertising and promotional content and stuff like that can gain an audience even when their messaging is thin or borrowed yeah. from other people. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much of that right now. It's so noisy. It's hard for guys like myself who've been working at this for nearly 40 years to have a body of work that's 500 published articles, you know, seven books, you know, hundreds of videos, blah, 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 blah. And somehow I, I, I get lost in the noise because some kid that's got five years of experience knows how to play with, you know, Instagram and is a rock star. And blows it out. It's got a million followers already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, it just, oh. To me, I, I, so I, I wonder about the authenticity of some of the stuff that people are sort of using to create a name for themselves. I think it's being misused. Great point. Let, let's, let's unpack authenticity a little bit. What do you mean by that? And what are the things that you recognize when it's there? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, at the highest level, it's just being who you are and not trying to put on any airs or be something that you're not, right? Mm -hmm. So so for me, the sort of the definition of authenticity is somebody that keeps it real. They're true, they're true to themselves. You know, you got to accept me with all my warts and blemishes. That's how I try to live, right? You, you know? Well, it's kind of like our live and let live philosophy, right? I, I, yeah, yeah, it's it's what you see is what you get. You know, I'm not, I, for me, I'm trying to live in a way that I'm not putting out any airs or being anything but who I am. Um, but so that's sort of the first part of the question. And I guess. And does, that, does that have a sense along with it? A, a, a registration in, in your being? A feeling? Well, I, I certainly feel when I when I'm not being myself, you mm -hmm. know, when I'm putting, you know, trying to put on the right, you know, uh, clothes, if you will, <laughs> you know, to, to, to of the many hatmas selection, okay. which hat yeah. are you going to wear? Right, right. right. I mean, we all do it at some level, but sure. You know, but but I know when I'm not acting the way i want to it bothers me and i try to adjust in this in the moment and, in, in the perception of others it, because this is where we you know the discernment of truth right authenticity and those kinds of things when you're feeling it when you're in the presence of one who's being authentic how does it affect you so that you at least believe that they're truly being authentic yeah i mean I, I, well first off in most circumstances, you immediately are attracted to somebody who's keeping it real. Yeah. And, and you're building trust as you go along, even if it's someone you just met. If you feel like they're really authentic, they're really who they are, you'll start to pick up on that and you'll pay more attention and, and you'll give more of yourself. You'll be more vulnerable and so on to make that connection. I'll just give you this a really silly example, but it just happened to me yesterday. And I can remember uh, thinking about it this morning when I woke up. I, I'm at a driving range, a golf range, right? And I'm testing. Oh, I out, love to play too. <laughs> so I'm testing out a new golf club that I'm thinking about buying. And I forgot my tool in the car to adjust it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, must have been a driver then. Hmm? Yes, it was a driver. Yeah, okay. So I look over at the next bay and I see this guy and he's got his full bag with him. Meanwhile, I only have the couple of clubs I'm trying to test drive. And I ask him, you know, do you have one of those tools on you, a wrench? You know? And he's like, oh, yeah, I think I might. And he took the time away from what he was doing. He was hitting balls too, you know, and he finds it and gives it to me. And I make my adjustment and I hand it back to him and thank him. And, he says, um, well, I'm going to keep it right here. So if you need it, just come back and get it. And I said, no, 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 you know, put it over with your stuff so you don't forget it when you leave, you know. And then I walked back over to where I was and I hit some more balls. And 
when I was done, he was still hitting. I, I kind of walked by and thanked him again. And he's like, you bet. But the thing that I got from him in that really modest exchange was just, he was a nice guy. I just had a feeling he's a good guy, mm -hmm. trying to be helpful. He's willing to, you know, hey, take the thing, you know, get come, don't even ask, you know. And this is with somebody he had just met. I had just met him, right? And he was saying, take it, you know, take the tool, you know, whatever. And a lot of trust there. Yeah, a lot of trust. And again, it's a really small example. But I definitely had the feeling, you know, through that interaction that this guy is who he is, you know, and 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 I have this thing, maybe it's from years of coaching and consulting, where you've got to read a room really quickly. Oh, yeah. And I've developed that skill, I think. And most most times than not, I get a pretty good read really fast. And I could immediately start to think like, okay, he's a working class guy. He just got out of work. He's hitting some balls. He's... And I immediately kind of connected with him, you know. Mm -hmm. And there were certain visual things that probably reinforced that in my head, but sure. And who knows what they are at this point? I, I'm not really. Well, there's sure. indicators we pick up that yeah, we don't necessarily know what they are, but we get a good read anyway. Right. I I can relate I to that. Oh, like this is like a really good, just a really good guy. It's um, probably never see him again, but <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And, and your comment about reading the room, though, it, it's ultimately in doing the work that we do. I spent twenty years doing partnering workshops for building road and bridge construction, mm -hmm. and tough crowd, right? Yeah, Very practical, pragmatic. You know, they want concrete things, <laughs> literally. No BS. Yeah, uh, and and yet because of the adversarial nature of the personal agendas that you have to expose and, and bring out and then dissolve in order for the team to grow together. Those are, are some really interesting um, experiences to be in that place. So, um, and it's tough to do. And maybe part of why, you know, the greatest fear or one of the greatest fears is public speaking above death and, and divorce even mm -hmm. uh, because you've got to have that and, and you're feeling that energy uh, yeah. just being on stage or in front of a group or in the middle of one there's that energy especially when it's present it can be really intense and being how do you make yourself available to the flow in the moment with those groups because there's a certain place one has to be in in order to be most effective how how do you achieve that and how do you describe being in that place hmm. yeah i mean it's a real tough one I, I i think part of the calculus i go through is i'm there to do a job so the acid test that i like to apply it's one that i learned from from a guy that was the chairman of Baxter International. His name is um, Harry Kramer. Uh, Harry had this layoff. He, I think he had to lay off tens of thousands of people at one time. He uh, was asked by a, um, a business columnist who was interviewing him, you know, how can you sleep with yourself? You know, impacted so many people's lives and all that. And his answer was what I something I sort of fashioned into what I call a decency acid test. And it's two simple questions. Did I do what I thought was right? And did I do my best? Mm -hmm. and what he said was, if I could answer yes to both of these questions, then I can sleep at night. And, and I kind of feel the same way about the, the scenario that you describe. I mean, I'm there to do a job. I've got to try to do my best. I got to do what I think is right. I can feel all those things, but I can't succumb to them. I have to get above that because I need to do something to have an impact in this group. Would you term it more as allowing your innate skill set that you've developed to do that performance take over? It's like you get out of your own way and let it I take over. I do. <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and sometimes I'm more effective than others, but uh, that, than other times. But yeah, it's a, it's about you know just trying to, especially when I'm feeling that. Energy sure. To, to and and there's all kinds of, of right. um, not necessarily impedances, but impactful um, things, 
such as how the planets align that day, what your biorhythms are, yeah. right? All of those little nuances that most of us don't pay attention to that can have profound effects, especially if it moves us out of alignment and we can't find a way back in. How do you have those moments and how do you deal with them? Well, I know when I'm having an off day. I mean, you know, and I, again, I'll use a really simplistic sort of example, but you know, you can be out on a golf course and you're just not hitting the ball. Yeah. You're just not hitting it. You know, the day before you were, now you're not, you know. And uh, one of the things that you have to, again, starts with self awareness, like, I'm not having a good day right now, right? My swing's off. I can't, I don't have the time to analyze it and discover a fix. I, and I better not try to make a fix. I just have to go with what I got. Yeah, go hit the ball. Right. <laughs> Do my best, you know. And, and it's, it's that kind of awareness. And then it followed up very quickly behind that is self-talk. So if I do have a bad shot because I'm not having a great day, remind myself, you know, the world's not coming to an end. There's an opportunity to practice hitting it out of the trees now. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Well, and that, so you know. Basically go with it. Go with what you've got. I, I don't think about all this stuff around biorhythms and all that. I, I, I think. I know. I, that, and most of us do And however, those something, do affect. Something to it probably, yeah. right? <laughs> but I'm not consciously or deliberately considering it. And I'm just kind of recognizing that I'm not having my best day right now, but I still mm -hmm. got to get through it and I've got to do my best. And and you don't carry the attitude from one shot to the next. Right. For the exactly. most part, you learn yeah. it's kind of the Zen of golf, right? Yeah. You're in the moment yeah. with the swing and beyond that, that's all you've got. You're someplace else. Right. It, that, that moment is all you have. Yeah. And, and the result of that swing is all you can live with next. You don't get to hit it again. You know, right. or you hit it out of bounds, I guess technically you could, but well, well, yeah. Just, but but you know, uh, you know what I what I'm getting. Unless you're just starting out playing with the guys and you have a breakfast ball as a mulligan, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, I mean in general, if we're if we're playing the game the way it's supposed to be played, you gotta live with whatever you do. And it, and what's so great about golf is it is all about you. Nobody's, it is, and it's all about the integrity. Right. The yeah. honesty and and right. the scorekeeping of like this is it and it holds that level of accountability and and the teaching of it. This is one of the things that you know both of us I think have probably played golf most of our lives, right. and it gave us this sense of genuine happiness and pride and. and you know, feeling good even on a bad day because you're at least on the golf course. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, in this, as you got older, was there were there any developments of any particular connections or uh, information sources, um, physical, non physical, that accompanied you at, at various stages in your life well again i mean i, I guess i'm always sort of listening right it, it's said mm -hmm. you know am i getting what i need because i believe that i will if i listen you know important that, and that i think is a key feature right you have to believe it's like not to be scriptural or anything but there was a guy the long time ago that says anything is possible to those who believe yeah right it's that belief factor so how did that transform what you experienced in life well it's a pretty powerful belief you know and i and i think it was cultivated in a real early age um it probably has to do with sort of this catholic upbringing i had from an early age uh, and then it was sort of further reinforced, you know, with the the mentors and stuff that I mm -hmm. that I found along the way. And uh, you know, it, it if you believe that if you if you believe in abundance, if you think that you know, there's plenty for everyone. There's plenty to go around. Uh, 
you're open, you're more vulnerable, you're willing to be empathetic, you're willing to help somebody else out because you believe there's enough to go around. Mm -hmm. If on the other side, you're of the sort of the scarcity mindset and you don't think there's enough, then, you know, you're going to be selfish. You might even do some things that 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 is that aren't uh, even handed to to get an advantage right because you don't think there's enough to go around so you're really fighting for the the, the scarce right. resource right so so much of it is is that basic belief and and like i said i i believe that i'll get what i need hmm. and you do and i totally I agree think it's, mostly that, yeah i think so <laughs> it, it works it, it does you and i are both living examples of that and i'm sure there are many others and if you're not an example of that, maybe you should listen to what we're talking about and see if any <laughs> of it sticks, right? Um, and speaking of sticking, is there, um, in this, the conversations you have, the business environments, there is this upbringing. You mentioned Catholic Church, okay? So religion plays a huge part in people's lives. And yet this kind of activity the engagement of reality doesn't seem to have really a, uh, it, it seems much more when you reveal it and you talk about it to just be common sense. Hmm. And so how do we make sense common <laughs> beyond the boundaries that all these other ancillary systems seem to put in place to maybe unintentionally separate, but still separate. How, how do we come together? Yeah, you know, it's it's a really, uh, again, a really challenging question. And, and boy, if we can figure that out, what a great world it'll be, right? Um, well, I'm hoping that we can figure it out. These kind of conversations are the <laughs> beginning of that, right? We got to yeah. talk about the possibility. And, and even to the point of, you know, why would it be so impossible for world leaders to actually sit down at a table and have a pleasant conversation with each other about things and not be, you know, this adversarial kind of thing? Okay. And maybe they are able to, and it's the media that, you know, gives us the opposite opinion. Yeah. I mean, certainly, I think the media can exaggerate it and make it make things worse than than they might actually be. Mm -hmm. um, but but I would say this again: it comes down to mindset. You know, are we it, are we looking at it like there's plenty to go around, or are we looking at it like there's not enough? And we, if we really want to make this fundamental change that you're describing, we've got to help people start to see it through the abundance lens. Sure. We've got to help them through awareness, through coaching, through our writing, teaching, you know, all that. I, I think it, it's about shifting that mindset so that we're a little less selfish. We're a right. little less about, our, about that, what, you know, how we're projecting ourselves on social media and all that. Sure. And those kinds of things are, are imperative, in my opinion, as well. And, you know, the, the notion of writing it... Um, my recent book, uh, Navigating uh, Holistic Growth, The Servant Leader's Guide. How do you see servant leadership fitting into this next um, layer of how we do business globally? Yeah, well, it, it, certainly it's a, it's a critical element of it. You know, so as a leader, just by definition, and if I'm viewing my, my role as a leader, is serving the people that I'm leading, right? Mm -hmm. And I am about adopting an abundance mindset. I, I don't have to be the star of the show. I don't have to brag about my title or let everybody know I'm the boss. I can let my team shine. I can let them be successful. I can take the steps to help them be the stars of their their, their show, you know? And, and I kind of think back to, the, to some of, the underpinnings of that concept. I mean, I don't know. I go at least as far back as Joseph Campbell, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Joseph I loved the series with him and Bill Moyers. Yeah, yeah. And and what was it about? You know, it was a great reminder that we're all on our own sort of, you know, star of the show journey, and mm -hmm. everybody else is sort of just bit players in that journey. 
you know. Right. And and that, you know, if you're going to be uh, you know, a certain leader, you've got to remember that you're only a bit player in all of the people on your team's personal journey. They're the stars of their own show. And can you help them feel like the stars, you know? Right. And, and do you find that there is a um, a pause for analysis, the what ifs? Okay, what if I do this as opposed to what if I do this? And then being able to weigh those um, results or, or imagined results as to what would be the best route to take. How does that fit into connecting with that inner drive that would allow a, let's say an empathic resonance to be present in the direction that you need to move and first of all is that a, a valid scenario well i mean i like to think that and again i'm going to answer it more in regard to the leadership stuff because that's really mm -hmm. what i know right sure. but, but i mean i my belief is that that calculus that you're describing happens when we're learning a new sort of leadership skill, when we're folding something into our leadership repertoire. Mm -hmm. Once we master it, though, then it becomes more automatic. So the calculus is less. And so, you don't think about it anymore. It's right. just who you are. Yeah, I'm choosing the right leadership style for the moment because I know what the right leadership style for the moment is. So yeah. I don't have to think about it. And it's sort of like a world-class athlete. I mean, they they learned the fundamentals and they were taught specific things to do to to perform at a high level. And once they mastered them, they just kept building on that, building on that, building on that, to the point where now they don't think about it. You know? well, and you mentioned that, even the thinking, the imagining, right? The, the gamma zone is what they call it, right? And where athletes have been hooked up to the stuff and whether they're imagining or actually performing, the brain responds the same. Right. Yeah. So think of the impact that that can have in just sitting and visualizing and then getting up and doing the work, right? right? Put yourself in that place. It's amazing the kind of results you won't, I can't see that. Um, you'll find a part of yourself you never knew existed. Hmm. And it's one that you always thought did mm. but you didn't let it loose sure yeah i think right. you're right so and and that's that kind of, of uh, well uh, where i originally got reconnected with the i or the notion of empathic resonance was with an interview with matthias demont and T tucker carlson i'm not sure mm. if you picked that up or not mm. um Matthias authored a book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, and it was about how the media handled COVID. And mm -hmm. then in the interview with Tucker, Tucker says, you know, uh, what did you find uh, the silver lining in it, right? And, and Matthias responded, well, it seems that what people are really looking for is empathic resonance. Mm -hmm. And it's that thing that feels right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, so how do we, how do you, obviously you do, right? How does that come into play and, and what are the types of things that give indicators that it's in process and, and that this sense of, of where you need to go is actually where you need to go, right? Because we do have that ongoing filtration system, if you will, yeah. right? How's yeah, it work for you? For me, it's it's looking at the results. You know, am I getting from point A to point B in about the way I imagine? You know, mm -hmm. uh, am I doing the work? Am I back to the decency acid test? Am I doing the right things? Am I, you know, uh, did, did I try my best? Because my best has to be good enough. I, you know, I, I, and sometimes you have to say it's not. Yeah. Right? Or, or decide, like, okay, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to learn a new thing. To yeah. it and it's not the, as you know, and, and <laughs> both of us and, and many others like us espouse that, you know, failures aren't failures. Yeah, absolutely. They're simply steps to learning. Right. 
But even that's a great example of the mindset shift because some people look at failure and they'll beat themselves up. Mm -hmm. You know, look at how dumb I am. I can't even do this versus shifting that or flipping that script between our ears and saying, what a great opportunity to learn. I, I didn't, I don't have what it takes right now, but I'm going to learn about what I need. And the questions that come from that is what do I need to learn, right? right? How can I be better? Yeah. And be willing to put the work in practice, you know, work at it. Yeah. 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 So in the, the overall scheme of things, what kinds of things do you think are most important in how business develops in these next few years as we're coming out of a major kerfuffle in the world shifting mindset to mind flow possibly as far as you know incorporating this inner side of development now that seems to be becoming more present and and available even just to talk about right without feeling or without being perceived as being crazy or weird right? It's becoming more acceptable. How do you see that moving into the future and the likely events that it may precipitate in the evolution of how business is done? Well, I, I think to the, in the spirit of having more people adopt an abundance mindset, it, it has a place, right? So mm -hmm. if it's part of that transition that I think we need to make from one where we're being selfish and self-centered and doing only things that are good for us and not caring about, you know, our colleagues, our family, you know, just doing what we think is right, are uh, good, good things for us um, to achieve what we have set in our mind and making it more about believing that there's plenty to go around, the better we're going to be. And mm -hmm. that's in all walks of life, business, community, our home life, and so on. So, so to me, that's yeah, what we do anywhere, we do everywhere, and what we, how we behave it is ubiquitous, yeah. right? Yeah. The effects that it has. I, I I believe that to be true, and so yeah. So for me, it's about you know if we can get in touch with those things that help us recognize there's plenty to go around, and better off we're going to be. Do you see the evolution of business moving away from a focus on competition and profits and more toward collaboration and people and planet? I think it's a bridge too far, frankly. You okay. know, I, I just think that that where it's sort of survival of the fittest instincts that continue to kind of get in the way of of, of that vision for the future and I, I i can't imagine that we're gonna get there at least in our lifetime what if we could I well, what might <laughs> yeah I, I hear you and, and that's a that's a very pragmatic perspective right and, and i agree given on where we're at right now it's kind of i don't know if we're going to do it or not right if we could what might we see as examples or evidence that it might be happening? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, I would see that there'd be more general cooperation. There'd be more uh, of an idea that we're in it together versus sort of the tribalism that I think we're experiencing at the moment. Um, you know, if we really, because because an implication of what you're describing, Zen, is really the idea that human beings are the tribe. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, right now, that's not how we operate. You know, it's... it's I agree. And it's around boundaries that we've kind of arbitrarily created, you know, that even in our, our country, right, North and South and conservative and liberal and all these things are artificial we've kind of created these labels and and as a consequence we're living inside what we think the rules are for that tribe mm -hmm. do you but think that the diversity and inclusion um <laughs> that is that the window washing um or, okay um 
I for the most part, I would, I would I, agree. I with we, you. You know, it's good to talking, think about. We, we've been talking about this stuff for at least the better part of two decades. Uh, I was going to say close to 30 years. Yeah. Right. So, so I'll go with you there, three decades, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and I can remember writing articles about it. Like in 1999, I wrote an article, is it diversity and inclusion or is it adversity and delusion? And I talked about, you know, while the spirit of diversity and inclusion were, was the right thing, that in practice, we're doing this other thing which is not what diversity and inclusion. So this goes back into that notion of inside and outside, right? We haven't got in touch, and I'm just saying that this may be a possible perspective of it. Yeah. We haven't gotten in touch with the inside. You know, we, that we're bereft of dealing with that inner sameness and recognizing that in the other and, and using going back to the old language like namaste and in la catch and things you know namaste is the divine in me recognizes the divine in you thousands of years old in la catch i am another you thousands of years old have we not learned anything we're still such a uh, um, adolescent society you know yeah. and every nation has its own kind of personality and in, in what it's uh, and where it's at in the maturation cycle. Now, is it possible that as a collective, one of the things we might see is that we start looking at the most devastated areas of population in on the planet and taking care of them? You know, those places where it's war torn, it, it's poverty stricken, it's famine stricken, and if you know, if we for and most people have at least some semblance of a religion in their lives. And it, it would seem like, okay, the bottom line of it is we're brothers and sisters and we should love each other, right? Well, how do we demonstrate that? <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's I mean, a very simple way of getting back to that. It, I, I think I think so. But I think in practice, it, it, in theory, it's great. I think in practice, it's something else. I think... <laughs> Could it be in practice? And, and are there things that you see in, in your field that could be implemented to help make it so? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess where I was going, and, and, and I think the idea still applies in, in the refinement of your questions. And I mean, it's um, we only give enough of ourselves and the resources we have available to us to make us feel good mm. about giving that to somebody else. And and that's really my, and I don't want to sound like Ann Rand or any, you know, <laughs> any, any of those, uh, those uh, sort of- Objectivism, right? Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, altruism is a kind of an interesting concept. Isn't it? But, but I think it's limited by our human nature and, and part of it's the selfishness part. And for the you, most part, you might give more of yourself than I do because you need to give more to feel good than I do or whatever, you know, like the, those the, the, those kinds of differences. But I do think that at, at the end but of the day, do you see even you have your limit? <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. We all have our limits, and, and yet sometimes those limits are, are in, in some instances a little larger than what we believe. Now, yeah. Especially in today when there's all of these multimillionaires that are being created right. and things. And, and is it possible then to maybe start working on their conscience and being able to say, hey, what about, you know, redirecting this? And, and you can have more of this if you do this over here. Right. And that was a nice thing to validate that thought. Um Interesting how electronics kind of chime in every <laughs> right. right. No, I mean, I, I mean, we're seeing people do that. You know, all the folks that have pledged to give away most of their billions of dollars and stuff. But again, uh, applying that that sort of definition that I roughly threw out there around um, around altruism, they're not giving it all away. Mm -hmm. their kids are still not going to have to ever work 
and probably their kids kids aren't going to ever have to work again you know they'll have plenty for themselves even if they give away the majority of what they've they've made sure. so yeah. so yeah I, I i think there's evidence that that's that's something that's that's taking shape there seems to be more momentum in that regard i think the push in corporate uh, in large corporates towards doing things that with more social consciousness you know it, it is a theme but there again you know you've got um you know uh places where budweiser runs a commercial and all of a sudden people are shooting you know bullets at cases of budweiser and their stock drops and you know so so you know it, it just, yeah, I, I and I realize that there is <laughs> a, a a, <laughs> there's such a complexity in it that's all, and, and yeah. you know, yet what we seek is some way to make it uncomplicated, and and yeah. I think that has to do with just personal attitude and how we how we move in our own circles. What would you feel it is, you know, from a, a from your standpoint and, and uh, perspective, uh, uh, something that you could offer to uh, in the way of personal leadership, uh, managerial style, professional leadership, you know, changing the world. What what are what would a basic fundamental offering be that you would think would assist others? Or what have you found seems to be one of those simple defining moments that could be taken advantage of? Yeah, I, again, Zen, I, I've got to answer that really from sort of that le leadership coach point of view, because that's really what all I'm qualified to, to really talk about. The rest is sort of just... And we are all leaders. Yeah. We, we don't kid ourselves. But, 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 right? but, well, I'm with you, 100%. Uh, but but I guess I'd, I'd, leave, I'd leave the conversation uh, with this idea, you know, as a leader, make it about them, not you. So leadership's about making people better it's not about you know stuff in your own ego it's got to be about the people you're leading do everything you can to to help them be the best they can be you're going to experience personal satisfaction when you do that and they're going to experience satisfaction as they move ahead and accomplish more and i think you know it's a small way but it's a step kind of a we go instead of ego right Exactly. Yeah. It's definitely a step in the right direction if we start operating that way. Awesome. Jim, it's been just an amazing conversation. I, I'm surprised by how quickly it went. Yes. <laughs> I feel like we could have a, a great further session too. Uh, and hopefully that, that occurs. So I want to thank you personally for taking your time and, and coming to share great wisdom and, and your perception and, and perspective on leadership and how that might assist in changing the world for better. Yeah, it's been an, uh, an honor and great fun to spend this time with you, Zen. So thank you for this opportunity. No, oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for showing up again. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. Please share and comment if you would. We'd love to hear your thoughts and to see it go much further than it has already. And I'm Zen Benefiel, your host. I'll see you next time.